Welcome back to 4060 Warners. This will be the last lecture of the semester, though hopefully not our last meeting. I'll make sure to put up a review session where you guys can come in later on this week uh, and review with me, hopefully live, and also have some materials associated with that uh, so that we'll have something to do when we meet. But this will conclude our coverage of sockets and network programming. For the moment, then, we are here at the last day of lectures, Monday, May 4th, and a few logistics announcements associated with that. You have a lab that is due this evening. I think it's lab 13, but it might actually be lab 12. I've sort of lost count of those things, uh, having had to make so many of them. Uh, and also, the big news today, uh, I have extended the deadline for Project 2 on, for a few days. Uh, I had a number of requests from folks about this, uh, and it's definitely uh, been difficult for some of you to make headway on this and I haven't had a lot of time to provide uh, feedback and uh, debugging support on it so I've decided to give you guys a couple extra days this will also allow me to get out those promised advanced tests uh, so that you have something to go on as to whether you're implementing that stuff correctly so then make sure also to mark your calendar for Monday, May 11th from 4 to 6 p.m. That is our final exam. As we have done in the past, we will have a uh, sort of grade scope based exam in which you guys have to log in and do this uh, at that point in, uh, in time. And it will probably take two hours, although the exam itself will be designed to take less time than that. I'll have a practice exam uh, and some review materials ready for you later this week uh, so that you have something to study in advance of that. Our goals then today are just to wrap up discussion of sockets to talk about the server side of thing and uh, things and look a little bit at what the internals of the operating system uh, look like in order to provide the socket facility uh, while relating it back to things that we've seen before. Uh, some of this is covered in Stevens and Rago chapter 16 and there are a few other resources alluded to throughout the lecture slides. We left off last time having discussed uh, uh, sockets from the client side uh, fairly uh, in some detail, uh, but we didn't yet discuss the server side. And we left with this sort of tantalizing, interesting problem where uh, just like every other kind of server arrangement, which will have to deal with multiple clients, so too socket-based servers are all going to have clients coming in on some well-defined location. Uh, for instance, Google.com, their web server has port 80 open and they'll have a bazillion clients contacting them for uh, web search results. And this leads to a coordination problem in which uh, Google have, may have the danger of sending me the wrong results as I you know, Google for something about sockets programming. Uh, if I instead get results back that were intended for somebody else looking up a cooking recipe or something uh, slightly more naughty than that, uh, for instance, uh, then I might be sort of miffed. And so an obvious question that we need to answer from the uh, server side is, what is the architecture of sockets in servers? What does it sort of look like from that one? Now, if you've been working on Blather, then you might have some ideas about effective versions of this already to ensure that clients are never given the wrong information by the server. Uh, and this basically played out in the FIFO land as there is a private FIFO that is going to each client and a private FIFO it uses to communicate to the server, uh, whereas there's a single sort of public FIFO that is used to join initially. As soon as that joining happens, uh, then you dispatch to use the private versions of this stuff. And it's definitely a, a useful sort of paradigm, so useful in fact, uh, that it's what sockets use as well in this respect, although some of the parts of it are automated and hidden behind the scenes. So typically a server is going to set up a public socket in a so-called listen mode. And this will be what's used to accept incoming client requests to connect to it. Uh, and this is done then on a well-known port number. And as the client like, wants to join uh, the server in some way to make a web request, for instance, uh, then the server itself, uh, via this special listening socket, will spin out a second socket. And it's the second socket that on the server side will do most of the business with the client. Whereas the client thinks it's talking to the server all the time on port 80, if it's making web requests uh, internally, that all gets redirected to this second socket that the server has uh, to maintain this connection to the client and not mix up communications uh, with any other client. 
this is all automated uh, fairly well behind the scenes in sockets. Uh, and so we'll need to understand it in terms of the outward appearance of how these functions call. Uh, but this should be familiar to you because uh, it's exactly what we've arranged for in Blather uh, just via FIFOs instead. Although some of the responsibilities of who creates what are a little bit different in the socket. Uh, so we'll walk through quickly the uh, system calls used to set up the server side for these sockets. And then uh, we'll proceed to sort of look at what uh, some real world or, or picture versions of internally what's happening on that front. Uh, the first thing to point out is that just like the clients, the server needs to allocate a socket of some kind. Uh, this tends to come in some uh, call to socket with a bunch of options, and there's nothing particularly special here uh, associated with this allocation. Uh, it's usually preceded by a address call, uh, which involves getting the address of the current machine, uh, because that's going to be the machine that is associated with uh, the server running. You contact me at this address on a particular uh, so uh, on a particular port, uh, and I'll be happy to do business with you. Importantly, uh, the bind call is what is, as a system call, enables the public opening of this connection between this socket and this open port in the operating system. And this uh, is something where you have to have system level permission to make sure that that port is publicly accessible and then be able to bind for the server uh, a socket to it. Uh, this will then uh, create a connection that so that when folks are uh, wanting to uh, talk to the server on port 80, they go in through this initial uh, socket that is bound to it, uh, this listening socket, as we'll call it in a moment. And the reasons for that will be apparent in the very next slide, where after doing the socket creation and the binding to a particular address location, typically a port on the present machine, then this listen call puts it in a special mode that is associated associated with accepting incoming conne uh, connections. Uh, this uh, has two arguments. The file descriptor associated with the socket we originally created, uh, that was back here, uh, and then the sort of uh, setting up of that uh, to, to be bound to a particular port. And then a backlog, which is uh, essentially how many uh, how much space the operating system should allow for uh, in terms of connections that haven't yet been accepted by the server uh, before it starts turning people away. And if you've ever uh, gotten like servers too busy kinds of message, uh, this is when the backlog fills up. Usually OSs have some hard limit on how much they can do here, but on a per program basis, you can specify uh, a little bit. Like I am willing to tolerate a backlog of uh, five or six clients. OS, please provide me uh, some internal kernel space uh, to to, you know, put those folks on pause until uh, my server actually kicks around and accepts them. Speaking of accepting, uh, that's the next system call that comes in this sequence. And notice then that these things up here, the listen and the bind and the, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the sockets allocation, the bind and the listen, these are all done once to this listening socket. But then in some sort of a program loop uh, that involves the logic of what your server actually does, this is where you'll accept connections. Uh, so as you would call accept here, uh, passing in arguments about the listen file descriptor, you also pass in a bunch of stuff that allows you to collect information in your program about this incoming thing. Who are they and uh, what do they want from me? Uh, to that end, what you get back from this is a new file descriptor. And in addition to populating these user side or uh, server side uh, data structures, uh, the kernel will create a new socket associated with this client file descriptor that is private to that individual client. So that as you would read or write to this file descriptor, you're talking to that individual client. This keeps the listening file descriptor uh, associated with accepting incoming connections. And so as we saw in Blather, where you have this joined FIFO, that's the place that this listen file descriptor takes uh, sort of precedence. Uh, and as each client would create these to and from FIFOs, uh, to server and to client FIFOs rather, uh, and those are where you do most of the reading and writing and talking between server and client. Uh, so too that model is followed here. It's just that on accepting connection, the server in its own internal space uh, allocates a new socket associated with this. And so as you would read and write to this thing, you'd be communicating with the clients. Reading would block until the client sends you something. Writing would send off stuff to the client who had better be waiting for that information according to the protocol you're implementing. 
Uh, this plays out uh, in p uh, actual code, and I think it's worthwhile to pull up at this point. We had looked at a simple client, and now we'll look at the corresponding simple server. Uh, those are present here, and for the sake of time, I've already compiled them. Uh, let me pull up simple client as well, simple client.c. Over here, again, in the simple client, uh, the basic paradigm was get the address of the host, uh, the server, uh, and then allocate a socket associated with that server's address, uh, connect to it, and then do business, as in read and write. Over here in the server, we see the basic, same basic setup, although we'll specify some options about what we want done on the present machine with the address, because in this case, the server code is the one setting up this publicly accessible port, in this case, 12344, uh, that is associated with accepting incoming client requests. Uh, still call it get address info, uh, but it's mainly associated with getting my present address uh, and uh, accessing a particular port, so that I can later on set some options about reusing, not important for our purpose, uh, but very useful for me as I rerun examples that uh, I don't get a socket in use uh, message or port in use message. Uh, but down here then, that bind to the server's address is what allows for the operating system to set any incoming connection that wants to talk to somebody who's listening on port 22 is going to talk to this program that owns this socket now. Uh, after that, then, uh, you'll see down here to put that uh, socket in listen mode uh, and then to go into a loop in which clients are accepted one at a time and in this simple server case, sent off a message to say hello world back to them. And this shows then in terms of program logic how this server is able to handle multiple clients, although it does so sort of synchronously. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if I come over here to a shell, uh, let's see, and start this simple server. Uh, I'll give a little bit of information about uh, where it's at. And in here, if I start this simple client, uh, then I get this uh, 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 connection over here uh, to this guy. Uh, and if I try a bunch of these, let's see, uh, I can probably do this a couple times. Uh, so if I put ampersands, uh, it will synchronously start up three of these or so uh, here, something like that. And I should probably just carrot this so that uh, my prompt is a little bit shorter. So you can see all three of those. We should get uh, three incoming uh, connections here, all of which uh, are going to get spit back this uh, hello world here. Um, so in that sense, they're all connecting to the same server, the present machine on this port that it's listening to, uh, but each of those is uh, connected uh, to a separate sort of internal socket by the server, uh, which is then able to communicate with them uh, a individual messages. There'll be fun modifications here uh, to uh, change the code associated with this uh, simple server uh, to, for instance, uh, report your uh, client number such and such, so one, two, three, four, counting upwards. That wouldn't be too hard to add in with a little variable here that starts at zero uh, and then increments each time we get a client. Uh, in that case, if you launched a whole bunch of simultaneously clients, uh, then it might be sort of arbitrary which one received this message from the server. Uh, they'd go a little bit out of order, just as when you spin up multiple child processes, you get concurrency issues where the scheduler decides who gets to run first and it's not always the lowest numbered child that gets to run first. We'll talk more about an extension to this uh, in just a second, but hopefully you're getting the gist that uh, this looks very familiar to uh, the Blather project, uh, and that's by design to set us up well to understand what's happening in this uh, server socket uh, uh, scenario. Well-defined join location, that's this listen socket, and then individual sockets that's private to each client that allows communication back and forth there. The big difference between this and the FIFO uh, situation being that these are ostensibly two separate machines. So the process running the server, it may be on a completely different machine that's distant from the client. And so the private socket over here is just on the server machine, uh, whereas the client machine, which is somewhere else, uh, it has its own sort of notion of I'm talking here and you're talking there. Uh, to that end, then, the picture you want to keep in your head is one of the following, that these client applications, uh, which are present on potentially different machines talking remotely to some server, they each have an open socket, and they all think they're talking to the server on port 80 and the socket that's associated with it, or on port 22, if the socket happens to be associated with like an SSH connection, 
But internally, this initial socket, this listen socket that's used to join on the server, it's only used for these incoming connections to spin up internal uh, sockets that are private to each of these clients. And this greatly simplifies then what the server has to do in terms of coordination. When it wants to write to client one, it writes into this client descriptor uh, that was returned when it accepted that client. If it wants to get some information by receiving uh, info from client two down here, it reads instead from this other socket over here. This single monolith over here then, as clients send in, the operating system automatically redirects traffic that was directed at, for instance, port 80. Uh, it'll see who is sending this. Oh, it was client one. Then I will plop that information down in the client socket that's associated with that on the server. Uh, so each call to accept creates one of these internal sockets that helps the server distinguish between the different uh, clients. You can see a little bit of this sort of dual nature associated with ports, uh, or sorry, associated with sockets uh, in the following. Um, so when you would spin up a server and a client, uh, then on the server side, uh, it knows that the client, uh, as it's talking, is going to talk to some port over here, uh, and the client itself is one, two, three, four, but it's over there. Uh, but it can distinguish between different sort of clients to some extent uh, by who they are. So the server itself is keeping track of who are you talking to uh, and uh, who am I with respect to you. So you, there are essentially four parts to a socket connection then that would be maintained on either side. The first is who is the remote entity that I am talking to and what is their address and what uh, port are they do they have open associated with this and who am I, uh, who's the local entity here uh, what is uh, my address and what port are you talking to there? This allows then, for instance, one machine to have a whole bunch of different ports open. Uh, they have the same address uh, and different clients sort of talking to it, uh, but it allows then to distinguish between, oh, here's a client that I'm serving web pages to. Here's a different client on a different address with a different port open. I'm still talking to them using this HTTP. Uh, and it might be also possible then to talk to the same client over a different port and serve an SSH or FTP connection instead by virtue of the fact then that you have this different port number associated with it. Uh, so to that end, this quartet then of uh, remote address and ports, local address and ports, uh, this factors into the operating system kernel structures that maintain information about these network connections and the sockets associated with them. If you want to know things about your local machine and the kinds of ports that it has open and the kinds of communications that are happening on it, then it's useful to be at least tangentially aware that there are tools that provide this. And doing a little Googling or recalling of this kind of a slide uh, yields some of those tools, including, I think, one of the all-time best Unix invocations ever, SS Tuna. <laughs> The SS utility is used to show information about open ports, and the combination of options, T-U-N-A, uh, in any order, will give you some more verbose information, such as the quartets that are associated with those things. Uh, I just think that it was very clever, whoever uh, put this up uh, in the Stack Overflow uh, post that I ripped it off from, uh, that they arranged it in the uh, format Tuna because the SS Tuna sounds like a fine name for a seafaring vessel, if ever there was one, and a classically named uh, Unix utility invocation. Uh, so running this kind of a command on your own system yields results that look something like the following. Uh, and just for, to make the concrete uh, example concrete, I've SSH'd into Atlas, one of the public lab machines uh, that is uh, associated with the CSE Labs uh, uh, system. If you know your stuff, then you'll know that SSH does its business over port 22, a fairly low numbered, well defined port. And when my machine, my local laptop, wants to talk to Atlas uh, and set up an SSH connection, then it will do so using port 22, although options to SSH can actually modify what port you want to do business over. My default is 22, and so as I would invoke uh, commands like uh, ss-tuna over here, uh, then I see a whole bunch of outputs associated with open ports on the present machine. Some of these are listed in the fairly readable uh, uh, IPv4 format and others in the uh, somewhat more obtuse uh, IPv6 uh, uh, versions of addresses. Uh, uh, importantly, all of them have a port number associated with them. 
my local address ports is can be somewhat arbitrary on that front. But if I have an SSH connection to something else, then in all likelihood that remote entity is uh, I'm going to be talking to it on port 22. Uh, so as I look over here for 22s, there are two obvious candidates. Uh, here, port 22 associated with this address and port 22 associated with this address. Now it's not clear which of these two is actually uh, Atlas as a machine, so let's ask uh, some questions using a second utility. Uh, this getEnt uh, is a utility I think associated mainly with uh, network programming, uh, but you can ask about the hosts that are associated with a numeric ID and ask for their symbolic ID. Uh, in this case, uh, first one in the list is actually right. Uh, that's this 128.101.38.193 is the IPv4 address for uh, CSE Labs at, uh, at cselabs.human.edu. Uh, if one would SSH uh, into this symbolic name, that is translated by the network addressing tables to uh, the IPv4 address shown here. Uh, so then uh, the port 22 there was a dead giveaway. If you're curious about this other port 22 over here, uh, I'll just copy this address and you can see this one is uh, uh, hosts uh, maximus.cs.umin.edu. Uh, this is a faculty server where our home pages are stored. And I tend to post all my lecture materials by creating a little locally mounted directory that's uh, moving through an SSH uh, connection using SSH file system. So then I just copy files like our lecture slides and so forth into that directory and they appear by virtue of the web server on uh, are publicly available to you guys. Uh, to that end, then uh, SSH is good not just for uh, logging into stuff, but also remote mounting stuff uh, to copy things conveniently there. Uh, you guys, I don't believe have access to this because it's restricted to faculty only. All right, uh, so then uh, aside from those sort of useful utilities, there's one other one that's useful to know about, both generally and for network programming, LSOF, short for List Open Files. Uh, actually, lists all open files on a Unix system, uh, comes stock default uh, with uh, Linux systems, uh, but can take uh, quite a while um, to spit out outputs. Uh, you can see my CPU going nuts here as it tries to listen, uh, list all open files that are on my entire Unix system right now. You can see there are quite a lot of them because we're down now to line 4,000 some here. Uh, and not all of these have anything to do with network programming, but by passing in this dash I option, uh, you can limit the outputs uh, here to network only or internet related uh, files, which tend to be uh, ports and uh, sockets that are open. Uh, and it will take some time because I think the default behavior of LSOF is to list all files and then just check their type. So as you saw, it's sort of streaming through, it's more or less grepping through this uh, to find uh, files of certain type. Uh, but this sort of underscores one thing that uh, I hope was apparent from the beginning of the class that the operating system has to keep track of everything that's going on on, and that includes all open files. So this is essentially an output table of all of the open file descriptors uh, that are in any program out there. Uh, to some extent, it may be limited by me as the user right now and what I can see versus uh, files that the kernel has open may not be listed here. Uh, I don't know for sure, but do know that you can uh, limit output here to the internet stuff, although uh, doing so takes some more time. It'll take a little while for this to, to spit that stuff out. Eventually, let's see, I'll see something having to do with that, uh, uh, let's see, uh, um, whatchamacallit, um, the SSH connection I had. Oh yeah, it's actually right here, uh, the uh, CS Lab SSH established. So this is somewhat more readable uh, than uh, to, um, well, Without having to go through that get ent business. And you can see over here then that uh, this is listed in a sort of awkward fashion that on my machine, this is the port that was selected locally to communicate. Uh, and then over here, the host name along with the uh, spot that I was logging into, you can see the protocol listed there, SSH, uh, rather than the port number. Uh, that leads to one other thing that we discussed uh, last time, and I just want to mention this now before we get to the exercise, that most protocols uh, that you would make use of, they have a well-defined port associated with them. That means by default, if you want to SSH or something, you communicate on port 22. And if you want standard web traffic, uh, then you would do uh, port 80. 
Uh, you wanted secure web traffic, then there's another port that's the subject of this week's homework associated with it. This is often stored in Unix systems in a little services table. Uh, and uh, Etsy uh, services is plain text file that just lists name of service and standard port number to communicate on. And this allows you then, as you would want to work with some networked entity uh, and know the service for it, uh, then you plop down the service. And in most cases, uh, the get address info here uh, will fill in by a lookup table over here, uh, that service, uh, the number associated with it, uh, rather than you having to remember them by number. And this is, as usual, uh, useful when it comes to uh, documenting your code, where if someone doesn't happen to know uh, port 80 is associated with uh, web traffic, they might be more inclined to know the symbol HTTP that has something to do with web traffic. Uh, and so service here, as it would show up in this get address info part, uh, is uh, sort of useful to say, oh, you, you want, you're doing something with web stuff here. It may also be the case, although I'm not completely certain of this, that if that server happens to run an HTTP server not on port 80, this might do the sort of lookup and pass in some way, give me the port that is connected to your HTTP server. Uh, but I'm not 100% certain on that and haven't tested it, so I wouldn't trust it at, at this point. Uh, all right, so uh, let us move back once because we've seen then some examples of this server setup business. And so, so to solidify your understanding of this, I think it's worthwhile just to engage, engage in the following simple exercise. Uh, to set up a server that I'll call a wait server and our pause server rather. And all it does is it waits until four clients have actually joined and it's accepted the connections from those four clients. Uh, after the clients all connect, it will issue a message to all clients saying, hey, uh, all four of you have arrived and now I'm shutting down. This is kind of a stupid sort of uh, thing to do, but you can imagine uh, this is the first step if you were doing some sort of a chat or game activity in which you needed a minimum number of players to proceed. And so being able to detect I have enough connections uh, in order to uh, proceed uh, with I've fully formed my team or my opposite pair of teams, uh, then I can proceed with the rest of the logic. And it will just demonstrate your understanding of how to call this basic set of system calls to set up server sockets uh, and get clients sort of online on that front. So uh, take a few minutes, uh, think this over, and think particularly about the control and data structure logic that you would need in your program uh, to build up off that simple server uh, to this slightly more complex example. I'll wait just a moment. So give you guys pause, a time, chance to pause, <laughs> pause uh, the presentation at this point, uh, and then we'll resume. So I think it's instructive just to relate this uh, basic setup back to the code we looked at in the simple server. So let me pull up that code quick. Uh, here it is. Uh, and we can walk through this talking about the adjustments uh, that will be required. So the basic setup is the same, that I'd still need to pick a port number for this server to operate on. And because I'm lazy, I won't bother using anything else aside from this one, two, three, four, four. Uh, I'll still need to initialize a socket by allocating operating system resources for this. That's the socket call here, and I'm still planning to listen on this thing. So not much has changed yet. Um, this set of options over here, again, uh, to reuse are not important to us. Like if you're restarting uh, programs from run to run, uh, it's not necessary. But what is necessary is this bind, as in I have to get the operating system to agree that any incoming traffic to this port is going to be delivered to the socket that I just set up. So that bind part still yet remains the same. There's nothing different in this pause server than there was before. Finally, then, uh, it's uh, equally like uh, the case that I have to listen on this because this setup of needing four different folks, uh, it still involves me accepting connections, and that's done by putting the socket in listen mode here. It might be worthwhile to specify I'm only going to tolerate a backlog of four here, but it's unnecessary in that case, so long as I get the rest of this program logic right. And now we're at the point where something should actually change. Because in, unlike the simple server, in which we had a continuous running of the, the server, uh, and any client that comes in uh, gets an immediate response and they gets closed down, uh, unlike that, this pause server is not supposed to abandon clients and it's not supposed to take an arbitrary number. It's instead supposed to take exactly four clients uh, and then move ahead with other program logic. 
to that end, this while loop, which is going to go forever until I kill this uh, server, uh, the while loop should probably be a for loop where I just iterate four times. Each time I run the loop, I'll accept a client, but importantly, I want to re remember the client file distributor I get by accepting them uh, because the OS has gone to the trouble to spin up a socket associated with that client. Uh, I want to plop that down probably in an array of length four uh, that is defined outside this for loop that I'm creating. So then, uh, as I would move ahead, once I get all four of those, then I can start writing to them, but probably I'd nix this writing business uh, during the loop itself, except maybe to notify them, you know, your client one of four, by, you know, please wait, your client three of four, please wait. The client four of four will kick us out of this uh, and into a separate loop where you'll iterate over each client, notify them everyone has arrived or, or that the server is shutting down, and close the file descriptors associated with those individual sockets. General flow then looks something like what appears on the next uh, slide, where each of these setup calls to create this listen file descriptor is essentially the same, but calls within this main loop uh, to accept clients, they each produce an individual socket for that client specifically, and so I'll want to save them in some sort of an array. Not declared up here, but could be done uh, very easily in a single line. After I have accepted all four clients, then I'll issue a mis message to each of them uh, by iterating through, making use of the file descriptor that's specific to that client, uh, and then writing into that, alternatively sending into that. Uh, this then concludes what this pause server is supposed to do, so I'll close down the listening socket uh, along with all the client sockets as it goes through. Uh, to that end, uh, this is the kind of sort of uh, thing that you should be prepared to do in a uh, exam setting uh, to demonstrate your understanding of how this sort of basic socket architecture works uh, and what you do and don't have to do in terms of setup. Importantly, creating the join location up here, this uh, listen file descriptor and socket associated with it is important, uh, but each time you accept a connection, you automatically get the sort of communication channel, the separate socket per FIFO or per uh, client. Uh, just as we had separate FIFOs for each client uh, in Blather. The last part of this then is just to mention quickly that sockets aren't only used for uh, uh, communication remotely. Uh, and the uh, sort of reference here uh, to Beej's guide on Unix IPC uh, covers this in some more detail. It's actually a relatively good guide aside from the fact that it focuses on system five uh, inter-process communication. Uh, but sockets uh, are provide a lot of conveniences that we didn't have with FIFOs. And so it's tempting it a lot of times to say, rather than using a couple FIFOs, because FIFOs are so so-called half duplex, like you can write into them, but if you read from them, uh, then you're going to be reading the stuff that you read, uh, wrote into it yourself. So uh, to have two-way communications, you tend to need two FIFOs. Uh, sockets actually alleviate that by putting that on the operating system uh, to essentially create these two buffers, one that's outgoing and one that's incoming. Uh, and so two clients uh, or a client and a server uh, could potentially each have their own sort of socket that's used to communicate with each other. Uh, this is nice because it's bi-directional, uh, but it uh, also shares this feature of FIFOs where it's just a byte stream. It's not segmented like a message queue is, so that's maybe the next level on that front. The nice part though of developing with sockets versus FIFOs or message queues is that uh, the option to set up a local socket is just a few tweaks to how you set the socket up initially. And if you tweak that back to being internet ready, uh, then there's, uh, you're, you've converted your program to being a local uh, to a uh, uh, potentially uh, internet capable program. And so sockets are extremely good for IPC that uh, is meant to eventually advance towards being internet ready. Many programs like this uh, have advanced in that way. And so it's uh, worthwhile there. Uh, to make this concrete, just a brief example outlining the changes you would make as you would want to make use of a so-called Unix domain socket, which is one that's completely local, not connected to the internet in any way, then you would pass in options to indicate that this socket is not necessarily uh, to be uh, using the internet, but instead to use the Unix domain instead. 
uh, you need to still uh, look up an address of some sort. And in some cases, you can even pass in uh, the name of a local file by, for the address of, of something. Uh, to that end, then, uh, no call to get address info because this is all local here, although you can substitute in some cases uh, uh, for that. Uh, after that, though, the client just needs to call connect uh, and you're good to go. You're connected to the server and the socket will be uh, local but have these two outgoing and incoming communication buffers that from the client's perspective make writes into it and reads from it uh, sort of work as you'd expect uh, for internet uh, based sockets. And on the server side, same basic premise, uh, change the options here to use the Unix domain instead, use a local file name instead of a uh, get address info. Uh, and after that, bind, listen, and accept connections. The same basic setup aside from option changes here that we used for internet stuff. This makes it very easy then to develop sort of local applications that are very ready to, with little effort, convert to remote applications. Uh, and if you plan for your applications to grow in any way, this is probably a good way to go. All right, that concludes our discussion of sockets for the moment, and uh, look forward to talking with folks during our lecture discussion uh, uh, later today, hopefully, uh, to survey some of this stuff. Uh, and we'll also have then subsequently some review sessions together uh, to help you prepare for the exam and finish out the project. Hope everyone is happy and healthy. Until we cross paths again, happy hacking.